All right, how's it going? Welcome back to another video for numbers and sets. In the, the past couple of videos, we have been talking a lot about proofs, right? And we've been talking about, well, first what proofs are and then what are different techniques that we can use to prove statements in math. And whoops. <laughs> and in the, the previous video, we talked about two main techniques that we could use to, to solve problems, where the first was the idea of a direct proof. So let me write that out, direct proof. And just as a, as a reminder, a direct proof is when you have some starting point, some ending point, and you wanna go step by step by step from the starting point to the ending point without any logical gaps in between steps. That's kind of like the standard, the straightforward way of, of proving things. All right, so we have the direct proof, and then we also had the proof by contradiction. So let's write that out as well. Proof by contradiction. And the idea behind the proof by contradiction is that you would essentially try to disprove the opposite of the original statement. And if you could disprove the opposite, that was just another way of proving the statement itself. So these were two different techniques that, that we learned. And it's absolutely essential that we know both of these techniques because depending on what type of problem we're trying to solve, one of these techniques may be more useful than the other. Okay, so it's kind of like, it's not that, that one is inherently better, but rather we can almost think of them as different tools in our toolkit and we can use these various tools at our disposal to solve whatever problems we end up trying to, trying to solve. Okay, so, so that, was, that was the last video. And in this video, what I wanna do is to slightly extend this list to introduce another method of proving statements in math. And I am not going to mention what that, what that method is, at least right now. And the reason why is because I want to introduce this new proof technique in terms of introductory logic. Okay. Notice that at the, the top of this whiteboard right here, we have the, I guess the section title which is all about proofs and logic. And we've done a lot with proofs so far, but we haven't done quite as much with logic. So what I'm gonna be doing in this video is, is to be introducing what is introductory logic, what are some very basic results that come up in introductory logic, and how can we use introductory logic to actually uh, provide another technique for, for proving things in math. Okay, so that's gonna be the, the, the goal for, for this video. Now, uh, before we actually get into talking about elementary logic, just really quickly want to talk about why should we be studying elementary logic? Because after all, it seemed like we were just talking about proofs and different ways that we could prove things, and now we're transitioning over to logic. Like, why are we making this transition? And aside from the fact that it provides another way of proving things, I think there are two, two main reasons for why it's worth studying. And the, the first is probably the most clear one to me, which is that logic is the, the backbone of all of mathematics, right? Like, like we could think of math as just applied logic. No matter what area of math you're studying, you need to follow the rules of logic in every step that, that you make. Okay, so, so one, that, that's probably one reason. And then the other is that, just to foreshadow a little bit, if I'm using that word right, uh, in the next video, we're going to be kind of moving on to, to set theory and elementary set theory. And it turns out that a lot of the results that show up in elementary set theory are very, very similar to the results that show up in elementary logic. So because of that, logic is kind of a, a nice little topic that can allow us to transition from proofs and different proof techniques and tra transition us into to elementary set theory and kind of begin that whole part of the video series. Okay, so that's, that's kind of why we're, why we're studying it. All right, so, so hopefully that makes sense. Now, in order to, to start talking about elementary logic, I was trying to think of different ways that I could introduce it. And I think the way that I want to introduce it is by relating it to how we first started learning about math when we were like four, five, six years old. And, and if you remember when we were that young and we were just starting to learn math, uh, 
you would think, what, okay, well, what are some of the, the, the very first things that we learned when, when we were that young? And hopefully we, we remember from back then that the, the first things we were learning were just the numbers and how to count the numbers. So we were learning how to go from one, two, three, four, how to count up to 10. And then if we got really advanced, we'd count all the way up to 100, right? And that was a, it was a big deal if we could do that. And what we were doing when we were learning the numbers and learning how to count was that we were learning the building blocks of introductory math. And that is the first goal here with, with learning elementary logic is we want to learn the building blocks of what, what elementary logic is. And fortunately, we already have encountered these building blocks and the, the, the building blocks of elementary logic are just statements. Okay, that might sound a little familiar. In case that does not sound familiar though, I will write out the definition of a statement. <laughs> I can spell it up here. Where the definition of a statement is a sentence. Sentence, did I spell that right? Yeah, sentence with a true or false value. I got a little lazy with that definition, but that it is a sentence that is either true or it is false, one of the possible two. Okay. And just as a reminder too, we don't necessarily need to know right away if that st statement is true or false, but rather once we do find out if it's true or false, it has to be one or the other. There's no gray area in between. Okay. So that's what a statement is. And a statement, uh, and statements are the building blocks for elementary logic. Now, how do we refer to, to various statements in, in elementary logic? Well, rather than writing out a sentence, because that's what a statement is, turns out that us people that work in STEM, we get very, very lazy and we don't want to have to write out a statement every time we want to use one. Like that's, that's why we're not English majors and we're not writing essays. That's why we like this stuff better. So just to, to show how we'll, we will refer to statements, maybe I can call one statement by a letter or a variable. And this letter or variable, which in this case I called A, will represent the entire sentence by itself. Just to give an example, I could say maybe two, the number two is even. That's a statement. And we know right away, two is an even number. That's true, right? So we would say that the, the value of the statement A would be true. Seems straightforward enough, right? Maybe let me move it over here just a little bit. So that A is that two is even. And that is true. Likewise, we could denote another statement with a different letter. And you can call these whatever you want, right? I'm just calling them A and B, just because. But, but we could also say uh, two is odd. Two is odd. And that's a statement as well. It's not true, because we know true that, that two is not odd. So, so we would associate B as being a false statement. All right, but these are just examples of statements. And all statements are going to be either true or false. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. If we wanted to, we'll see why I'm gonna do this in a second, but I'm just gonna add two more statements. And I'm not being very creative, but I'll leave that to you to be creative with whatever statements you wanna come up with. It doesn't even have to be math related, right? It could be, it could be anything, anything that you want, as long as it has to be true or false and nothing in between. Uh, but, but I'm just for the, the sake of coming up with simple examples, maybe I'll say a, a third and fourth statement, C and D, is that three is odd for C. We know that to be true, right? Three is an odd number. And then for D, we'll say maybe three is even. And we know that to be false. So D would be false. Okay. So these are just some examples of the building blocks in elementary logic. Now, going back to kindergarten, we're jumping all over the place today, right? Uh, it, going back to kindergarten, once we learn the numbers and once we learn how to count, ask yourself, what is the next thing that we learned right after that? And hopefully we, knew, we, we know that right after we learned what the numbers were, we said, okay, maybe I'll do this over here. I said, okay, I know what, 
what the number one is, and I know what the number two is, now I can, I can perform operations on the two, on these two numbers, like I can add them. And after I add them, I get a resulting number as my, as my output of one plus two. Okay. So we started to learn how to, how to, to perform operations on these numbers. And we learned about addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, kind of these, uh, these standard operations, right? Now, when it comes to elementary logic, we can't perform the same operations that we did back when we were five or six years old. And why not? The reason is because you can imagine that, that we cannot multiply two sentences by each other or even add or subtract two sentences. And, and hopefully that makes sense, right? The, the operations of addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, those are inherently operations that get applied to numbers. But we do not have numbers. We have statements or sentences. So because of that, we need to come up with new operations or what I've, I've seen some, some textbooks and PDFs call logical connectives. Because I guess they connect logical statements <laughs> called logical connectives. We need to come up with logical connectives that can act on statements. What are the operations like addition, like subtraction that act on statements? And there are, you, there are, you can be as creative as you want, but there are three, I'd say mostly fundamental ones that, that get brought up at least initially. The first logical connective is the one that represents not. Okay. So we can have not of a statement. For example, if we had uh, not a, that would be not true or false. Okay. So, so that's what not, that is a logical connective. And symbolically we represent not as this long horizontal arrow with a shorter or horizontal line with a shorter vertical line looks something kind of like this. Right? So, so that represents not. We also have or as a logical connective, kind of like we have A or B. So that takes in two, two statements rather than one, kind of like how addition takes in two numbers rather than just one. And the way that or is represented is with something that looks kind of like a down arrow. So it looks something kind of like this. It says A or B, right? And then the last one that we're gonna, at least the last elementary one, is the and logical connective. You might have been able to guess that, right? And with the, the and logical connective, that looks kind of like just the opposite of or, where it looks kind of like an up arrow, kind of like that. So these logical connectives are like the building blocks and we can make more complicated ones out of these three, but, but these are kind of the standard building blocks for the, the various operations. These are the equivalent of our plus minus multiply and divide when it comes to basic numbers. All right. Oops. So once we were learning about what addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, once we learned what those were doing, one of the next things that we would probably learn is, okay, what are our multiplication tables? What are our division tables, our sum tables, our subtraction tables? Well, they try to get us to memorize like seven times three, seven times four, seven times five. So we get that ingrained in our head. In other words, they were trying to get us to see how operations acted on various different numbers. So our next step is to see how these logical connectives act on various different statements. But for us, it's, it's actually a lot simpler than what we were doing when we were five or six years old, because there's only two types of statements. There are true statements or false statements. Whereas here, there are a bunch of different numbers, or an infinite number of numbers, right? Although we never said that when we were, when we were five or six. So that's what we're gonna do. We're, we're gonna see how do these operations act on various types of statements. And the way that these typically get organized is in something called a truth table. Notice how like when we were five or six, we had our times tables, but now we're doing elementary logic, we have our truth table. I don't know if that, trying to make a connection there. I, it's, I said it's pretty, pretty solid. 
Um, but regardless, that's what it's called. It's called a truth table. And what I'm going to do for the first two columns of my truth table is I'm going to denote two arbitrary statements as P and Q. And typically P and Q is the common notation that you'll see in textbooks. That's why I'm using these as letters to denote various statements. And hopefully you can imagine that if P and Q are arbitrary statements, that means P can be true or, true or false, and Q can also be true or false. So if we had to look at the possible pairs for the different combinations of P and Q, we would have four different combinations. The first is when they are both true. So we're gonna have true, true. And then the second is if one is true, one is false. Third is if we swap that order, so one's false, one's true. And the last is if they are both false, false and false. So four different combinations for any two arbitrary statements. And now we want to see that for all possible combinations of two statements, and this is it, there's only these four, right? Because it's only true or false. So for all possible combinations for two random statements or arbitrary statements, we want to see how these logical connectives act on these statements. And I'll start with the not. The, the not logical connective, because I think that's probably the, the most straightforward to see. Also, the, the not logical connective only acts on a single statement rather than two. So we only have not P, and, and that's, that is it. We could, we could have chosen not Q either. It doesn't really matter. We'll say not P. And we already mentioned this, but not P, or just not of a statement, just produces the opposite of whatever the statement original whatever the statement's original value was. So if p was true, not p is not true or false. So if p is true, not p switches it to false. If it's true, it switches to false. And then opposite here, right? If it's false, it swaps to true. True down here as well. Pretty straightforward, right? So that's how not acts on an arbitrary statement. Now let's take the, our next logical connective, the or logical connective. So this would be read as P or Q, like this. All right, and to, to see how P or Q as an overall statement behaves, whether it's true or false, that is why it shows four statements over here, A, B, C, and D. Let's start with the case where both P and Q are true, so we'd have true or true. The way we could read that as an example in English over here is by looking at statements A and C. So we would say two is even or three is odd. And the reaction would be, well, yeah, they're both true. So definitely one of them is true. So, so yes, the answer is yes, that is a true statement, what you just said. So if, if we have true or true, that produces a resulting true statement. Let's take the other relatively straightforward case where both of them are false. And that would be looking at statements maybe B and D, where we would say two is odd or three is even. And the reaction to that would be like, well, no, you're wrong on the first one, you're wrong on the second one. So you're just wrong, even though you provided two possibilities. So, so if you have false or false, that produces a resulting false value. So down here, I can write false like this. Okay. So those are kind of the more straightforward ones. Now, let's maybe look at one where one is true and one is false. And maybe we'll look at A and B. That's an example of true, true or false. And the way that would read is two is even or two is odd. We would say, well, yes, two is either even or odd because all integers have to be even or odd. So, so yes, you're right. <laughs> two is even or odd. It has to be one of the two. So true or false results in a true value. And hopefully you can imagine that true or false is the same as false or true. Because if I were to read this in English, one way of saying this is two is even or two is odd. Another way of reading it is two is odd or two is even. They say the same thing. The order in which we state them does not matter. The, the mathematical way of saying that, by the way, where the order does not matter, is that 
that it is commutative. Commutative means that that P or Q is the same as Q or P. The order, you could swap the order. Okay, so this is what happens when we apply the, the or logical connective. And hopefully we see that almost all of them are true except for, for the case where they're both false. In other words, as long as at least one of them is true, one of the two statements is true, we are going to get a true value for or. And only when they're both false do we get false. Okay. Now, let's move on to the and logical connective. P and Q, how does this work? Well, I think we should, again, start with kind of the, the more straightforward cases where they're both true or they're both false. And if they're both true, we would say, we'd look at A and C, and we'd say two is even and three is odd. And we're like, well, yes and yes. So you would be correct. So in that case, if you have a true and another true statement, you would get true. What about in the case where you have false and false? It says you, that would be you saying two is odd and three is even. You're like, well, no, you're not even right with one of them. So you're definitely not right with, with both of them. So, so that is unfortunately false. All right, now let's move on to the, the intermediate cases, the ones where one is true and one is false. That would be like A and B, where we say two is even and two is odd. And hopefully we realize like, no, that's, that's not, that's false. Because a number can't be even and odd, it has to be one or the other. So if we have one where one is true and one is false, that produces a false statement. And likewise, the, the and logical connective, it's also commutative, the order does not matter. We could say two is even and two is odd, or we could say two is odd and two is even, so this would be false as well. And hopefully we see that it's almost the opposite of, of P or Q, P and Q, right? It, we're going to get false as long as at least one value is false, one of the two is false, and the only time where you get a true is where they are both true statements. So that is how we can fill out the start of our truth table. Now, just, just a real quick note too. I, the way that I memorize how these are symbolically written is that the and kind of looks like the letter N. And when we say and really quickly, like A and B, we don't usually say A and B. We usually say A and B, you know? Or like in and out or in and out burger. <laughs> so a lot of times the and sounds like the letter N, which is what this looks like, which is at least how I, I memorize it. And then or is just the one that doesn't look like the letter N. Okay. So I don't know if that's helpful, but if it is, cool. <laughs> All right, so, so this is the, the start of our truth table. And this is unfortunately not the end of our truth table. I shouldn't say unfortunately, there's, there's still more for us to uncover. The, the next one that I want to introduce can be constructed from, from these operations right here, but it has a different symbol to it. And that symbol is the implies symbol. And this one can be a little bit tricky, so I want to take my time with this one. The other ones were not bad, but this one can be a little bit tricky. So the implies takes in two operations. And the more tricky just means the more interesting, right? And it's not a bad thing at all. Because once we understand it, then it's not tricky anymore. But, but, but this represents the, the implies symbol. So we read this as P implies Q. But another way of, of saying P implies Q is, is uh, I'll write it in quotation marks right here, is if P, then Q. This reads like this. Uh, th th these two mean the same thing. That's what I'm trying to say. This says if P, then Q. And this is an example of a conditional statement. Statements like this are called conditional statements. And notice too that if you remember from the last video when we were talking about direct proofs, we were saying if N is odd, then N squared is odd. If N is odd, then N squared is odd that this structure right here is very, very, very important because this describes the structure oftentimes for direct proofs, which is why we care about it so much. Okay, so we wanna find out when are these things true and when are they not. Okay, so 
hopefully that makes sense, at least what how this reads, if P then Q. I want to come up with an example to help understand the truth tables. And this is notoriously difficult. Uh, not, we'll, we'll see what I mean. Uh, but but I've, I've thought about this for a while, and this is probably the best one that I can come up with. But if, if you can find a better one, I'd love to hear it, because this is not an easy one to, to, to come up with examples for. Because if you were to try these A, B, C, and D combinations, it would not necessarily be obvious what the resulting answer is. So let me make some new statements over here. Maybe I'll call my first statement, I mean, I need a new letter, so M. And, and M will be the statement, I gotta go away from math to, to do this. <laughs> M is the statement that it rains. Take it rains. So if it's raining outside, it's true. If it doesn't rain, it's false. So that's statement M. And then statement N is I will stay indoors. Hopefully that's big enough where you can read that. N is I will stay indoors. If you stay indoors, N is true. If you go outdoors, N is false. Okay. And the way that I want to read M implies N is if it rains, I, the, the way that you probably should read it is if it rains, then I will stay indoors. That is how we read M implies N. However, I want to change that just slightly to help understand this column. I want to read this as if it, M implies N is the same way of saying if it rains, then I promise I will stay indoors. Okay, and that I promise I think is kind of key because that way for the overall statement, this overall statement is true if you keep your promise, you uphold your promise, and it is false if you break your promise. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. But that, that the, whether or not you break the promise is what determines if M implies N is true or not. Okay, I, I, this might seem like I'm really like getting specific on details, we'll see why in a second. All right, let's start with the case where we have true implies true. If it rains, so it does rain, then I do stay indoors. Did I, did I hold my, did I uphold my promise if it did rain so I stayed indoors? It's like, well, yes, I did that. That's what I promised to do, right? So, so that would be true. I, I upheld my, my promise. Next one, true implies false. It rained, but then I went outdoors. So did I uphold my promise that that's what, what happened? It rained and I said I was gonna, I promised I'd stay indoors, but I actually went outdoors. So I broke my promise, right? So that would mean that would have to be false. Hopefully those aren't too bad. It's the next ones that can be a little tricky. Uh, what if we now have false implies true? And unfortunately, false implies true is not the same as necessarily as true implies false. This arrow only goes one way, okay? So what if you have false implies true? If, if the first one's false, it does not rain, okay? And if it implies true, it did not rain, so I stayed indoors. Now, did I break my promise of if it rains, I promise I will stay indoors? And it's like, well, no, I did not break my promise. Why did I break my promise? It didn't rain in the first place. So I didn't have a promise to break because it just did not rain. So, so yeah, I, I, I did not break it. So, so I, I would have, have had to have held it just by not breaking it. I either broke it or I didn't. I did not break it, so it's true. And finally, the last one, false implies false. This is false. It does not rain, implies false. Uh, so I would go outdoors. It did not rain, and then I went outdoors. Did I break my promise there? And the answer is no, I didn't, because I only promised that I would stay indoors if it rained, but it didn't rain. So what I'm trying to say is that if it did not rain, then my promise just goes out the window. It doesn't matter what I do if the condition for my promise isn't true in the first place. So it turns out I didn't break my promise here either. 
So this would also be true. That, that can be kind of weird, especially if you're looking at some of these other statements trying to wrap your head around that. The only case where P implies Q is false is if the first one is true and, if, is, and the second one is false. Right. And again, that's probably the best, com the best example I can come up with or examples similar to that. But, but yeah, if you got a, if you got a, um, a better one, I would love to hear it because this one can be notoriously difficult. All right, now let's just go on to one more case and then we will be almost done. I'm almost done for the video. Let me just erase this stuff right here. This was primarily for, for this example for P and P and plus Q. I just want to put one more little column right here. And this is going to be oops, almost the same as this one. But notice that now I have a double arrow rather than, than a single arrow. And, and this double arrow right here stands for logically equivalent. Okay. And two things are logically equivalent if whenever P is true, Q is true. And whenever Q is true, P is true and the vice versa for false. It's basically this arrow, but it has to work in both directions. And this is, this is gonna be important for this third proof technique, because uh, it, it basically is based around this thing right here. Now, let's, let's see what, what, what this, how this comes about. Um, or what am I trying to say? Let's, let's see what, how this, uh, logically equivalent to arrow acts on various true or false statements. Start with the easy ones, I think. Uh, if we have true and true, that would say true implies true this way and true implies true this way. And you can imagine if you were to swap this arrow that, that you would have to act this column in, in different directions. So, hopefully, I don't know if that made sense. When the arrow is pointing this way, the only false one is true and then false. If the arrow points this way, the only false one is true implies false going that way. Okay. But what if they're both true in the first place? Then, then this thing has to be true because every value of P implies Q is true, except when, when we have one true and one false. You see that? Every other value is, is true, including the value when both are true. So this has to be true. What if they're both false? Now we'll, we'll go down here. What if they're both false? Well, this arrow interacts says that the only way this could be false is if one is true and one is false. And if the arrow was pointing the other way, that would say this is the only false one, right? But you notice that in order for this arrow to produce a false value, for implies to produce a false value, you need one true and one false. So if they're both false, you're, you're never gonna get that combination in the first place. So this is true. Okay. Now, what about kind of the intermediate ones? Where if we have one is, uh, let, yeah, let's take this first one, where P is true and Q is false. Well, if that's true, uh, here, here, let's, let's do this over here. Uh, P, P is logically equivalent to Q. Let's say that we have P implies Q. I'm gonna run out of room, aren't I? And Q implies P. That's how we can read this. Maybe this is probably the best way of describing it. P is logically equivalent to Q is the same way as P implies Q and Q implies P. Arrow goes both ways. Now, for the case where P is true and Q is false, we have true implies false, which is false, and false implies true, which is true. So this is false and true, and we know that false and true produces false. Why? Because false 
under this column for and, false and true gives us false. Hopefully we're able to follow that. So this is false. Now, for the third one, we'll, we'll go through this one. I'll try to go through this one again because that might have been confusing. The key is to, to realizing that this double arrow means that the arrow points P implies Q and the arrow also points from Q to P, like this. False implies true. Well, if, if, if P points to Q, if P implies Q, we have false implies true, and that would be true. That was this box right here. So we would have true and, now this one. Well, well now, this, if this is false implies true, this is true implies false. And true implies false is false. So we would have true and false. We know that, that uh, let's see, true and false would be this one, which is also false. So I, I'm saying all of this stuff out loud. I probably should be writing it, to be honest. But hopefully you can hopefully you get the picture that, that you can rewrite P is logically equivalent to Q as this thing right here. And then you can just break down the components based off of what's previously provided on the table. And this is how you can, if you have an arbitrarily complicated statement with a bunch of various logical connectives, you can just go piece by piece by piece and say true or false, true or false. And then you work your way all the way up to the final statement. So you just uh, break it into smaller pieces and that can eventually help you solve the whole thing. And there's, there's a problem on the, the first problem set that, that has you work through something like that. Okay. Hopefully this is making sense. Um, yeah. Now, last thing that I want to do, because we, we went through this truth table and this is just the basics of how introductory logic works. We still have not done this thing. We have, we have not talked about a, another proof technique. And it turns out that the other proof technique is involved right here. And I'm going to write it as, uh, I don't know if this is the official name, but this makes sense to me. Proof by logical equivalence. Proof by logical equivalence. What this is saying, what the proof by logical equivalence is, says is that if you can come up with an arbitrary statement that holds the same true or false values for all combinations of P and Q being true and false, that is another way of proving an original statement. I, I realize that could sound very confusing. I need to, I need to show an example. Um, here's, here's what I mean. Let, let's take this column right here, P implies Q. And notice that with this column, we have true, false, true, true. If we can find another set of logical connectives that also produce true, false, true, true in this exact order, that means that it's true for all the same cases that this one's true, and it's false for the only case where this one's false. If you can come up with another set of logical connectives that produce true, false, true, true, then you would say that you have found something logically equivalent to P implies Q. Hopefully that makes sense. The reason why that's important too is because direct proofs are based off of P implies Q. So it, another way of saying this is that if you can find another way of describing P implies Q with, that has the pattern true, false, true, true, then you have found an equivalent way of directly proving something. And, and that is another way of, of solving problems. Okay. And it turns out that there is something, I am running out of room, aren't I? What can I erase? I will erase the one plus two equals three. I hope you know that one plus two equals three. Um, there is something called the contrapositive. Contrapositive. Contrapositive statement. Contrapositive. And this is probably the, the most common example for a proof by logical equivalence. And we start with P implies Q. And we want to find something logically equivalent to P, to 
We want to find something logically equivalent to P implies Q. In other words, we want to find something that has true, false, true, true. So what is logically equivalent to P implies Q? It turns out, and you should check this for yourself, that if you write not Q implies not P, like this. And if you, if you were to plug in all the combinations for true and false and for P and Q, you would get that if this side's true, then this side's true. And if this side's true, then this side's true. And same thing with false. This is false and this is false, and if this is false and this is false. This is another way of, of saying this thing. This is a, a, an equivalent alternative to the direct proof. Okay. P implies Q is, is the exact, exactly logically equivalent to not Q implies not P. Okay. So uh, proof by logical equivalence, especially the contrapositive statement, not Q implies not P is another way of, of uh, directly proving something. Just to, to provide maybe like a concrete example, let's go down here. Now I know I'm running out of room. I probably should be erasing some stuff, but I'll, I'll get better with, at that as I, I make more videos, I think, and I'll learn how to organize it a bit better. Let's just say that down here, we say that P is, um, you're looking at some animal. I'm going to go back to the cat and the animal example. And you say it's a cat. P is that it's a cat. And Q is that it's an animal. Okay. And then P implies Q says that if it's a cat, then it's an animal. That's true, right? All cats are animals. What's the contrapositive of this? Not Q implies not P. Well, not Q says it's not an animal. Not P says it's not a cat. So the contrapositive way of saying, if it's a cat, then it's an animal. Contrapositive way of saying that is, if it's not an animal, then it's not a cat. And that makes sense, right? If there's something that's not an animal, there's no way it can be a cat. So that's, that's how this contrapositive statement works. And this is an, a, another way of, of proving statements. And you'll find that some problems taking the contrapositive is more useful than the direct proof by itself. Okay. Let's see, anything else that I want to go over? Stuff that I probably could go over. Uh, one more example, let's, let's do this. Let's do this down here. One more example of logical equivalent things relate to a set of laws called De Morgan's laws. Going all the way at the bottom. De Morgan's laws. And De Morgan's laws are a way of interchanging nots, ors, and ands. Basically, if we have, I, if we have, let's see, not two statements, let's call them A and B. If we have not A or B, like this, this is logically equivalent to, if we were to bring the not into both symbols individually and swap the sign to an and. So this is logically equivalent to not A and not B, like this. Okay, and then the, the, the vice versa statement works as well. Let me come down here to, to show it. Uh, we could also have not A and B. That is logically equivalent to not A or not B this. And these are De Morgan's laws. Now, how would you actually check this? You would plug in all possible combinations of true or false for A and B into both sides. And then you would, you would be able to show that whatever combination you came up with, if the left-hand side is true, then the right-hand side had to be true and vice versa. If the left-hand side is false, right-hand side had to be false. And, and the arrow goes both ways, right? And I am definitely running out of room, and I think you, you probably can be able to, to figure that one out yourself on how to actually do that. Again, you can really just go back to this table right here. Like, if, if A is true, B is false, then you would have, let's just do that one. Let's actually just do one, and then, and then we'll call it. A is true, B is false. That's what we're going to remember. 
If A is true, B is false, then we have true or false. And hopefully you remember from here that true or false gives us true. Only one of them has to be true to be true or false. So true or false is true. Not true after, on the outside is false. So the left-hand side of this is false. Now, uh, if A is true and B is false, we have not true on this side, and that is false. Not false on this side, that's true. So we have false and true. And hopefully we remember from the true table that false and true gives us false. So the left-hand side is false, right-hand side is false. And you can just do that for every possible combination. Okay. But I think I'm going to call it here. That's kind of a lot all at once. And again, I do apologize for being a bit all over the place. I'm going to figure out how to erase the board a, a bit better and not try to cram everything in all at once. Wish I had a bigger board, you know, that'd be, that'd be cool. But this is what we're working with. So uh, yeah, that, that's, that's all I got for this one. So thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video.